Hello, I'm Stuart Childs and you're welcome to the Dairy Edge of the Chagas Dairy Podcast. We're bringing you the latest information, insights and opinion to improve dairy farm performance. With the ICBF bending screen now available for farmers to indicate their cow bend, I spoke to Patrick Owen, Chagas Dairy Specialist, on options to address issues on farms where bending may impact. Bending means that cows producing less than 4,500 kilos of milk will drop from 89 kgs of N per cow to 80 and be classified as bend 1. Band 2 will see cows supplying greater than 4,500 kilos but less than 6,500 kilos increase from 89 kgs of nitrogen to 92 kgs of nitrogen per head, while band 3 will see cows that are producing greater than 6,500 kilos of milk annually be classified as producing 106 kgs of nitrogen per head per year. These changes may or may not impact on farms, so it is important that everybody establishes their position before making any decisions in relation to bending. I started by asking Patrick what options are available to farmers to alleviate the impacts of bending if it is going to have an effect on their farm. Look, every farm will be different and every farm will have different things that will work for them and other things that may not. But we have a list of things here that we can just talk through that may be applied to a lot of farmers. I suppose the first thing to start with is every hectare will have a nitrogen allowance, whether it's the 250 or the 220, so it's the total farm area. Multiply by your nitrogen allowance, and that will dictate your total organic end that you can carry on your farm. And everything you do then is, is how you impact on that total organic end, which will allow you to carry your less or more stock. So it's about me. The first thing I would say, it's about being efficient with the allowance you have, and then looking at things beyond that. I suppose is somewhere to start. And if we look at then, Stuart, um, I suppose the number of options to impact on that total allowance is you can. The simplest one to probably to account for is lease or buy or rent extra land. So you have extra hectares, which then therefore has more a higher allowance or a similar allowance, but you have more hectares. So you're allowed to carry additional livestock units overall. So you have a dilution effect, basically. Yeah, yeah. So it just brings you. So you had 40 hectares at, say, multiply by 220. It's 8,800 kilos of organic N. Obviously, if you go to 50 hectares, then the total organic N on the farm it will be higher um so that will allow you to carry additional stock if if you're required um so and we'll come back to that there when we whether how whether we should be getting the land or not or is that the first place to start with another one then potential has been used in the past and um is to export slurry so basically obviously when you're exporting slurry you're um taking some of the organic in produced on your farm and exporting or giving it across to another farm that will reduce the amount of organic gain on your farm. So that'll um, allow you to retain some of the organic gain for um, your existing stock. I suppose the one thing I would say about uh, exporting slurry is in reality, it can be, you know, every farmer now above 130 kilos of organic gain will have been a nutrient management plan with soil samples. So the likelihood of them being able to take in slurry is reduced. But the other thing in reality is, do you really want to be giving away your slurry? Now today's prices, give or take a thousand gallons of slurry is worth about 55 euro. So if you're exporting slurry, you're just basically taking P and K off your farm. Uh, if you continue to do that over the years, obviously you'll have a P and K deficiency and that'll have to be brought back in with chemical fertilizer. And so while look for maybe some people thinking around the edges or different scenarios, maybe if there's someone contract growing crops for you and you're giving the slurry to them um, and you are bring it back into silage, but in the majority of cases, you shouldn't actually be giving away your slurry because it has a, a P and K balancing figure on your own farm that could be, cost you money in the long term to replace. Uh, or, and if you don't replace it, then you'll have impacts on the amount of grass you can grow. And Patrick, I suppose the important point in relation to that, like where you said, where people are maybe contract growing crops or what a different arrangement in place for silage or whatever, that ground needs to be soil tested this year to ensure that that export can take place. And actually that needs to be done sooner rather than later, because you need to know if you're going to be in a position to actually export the slurry quantity that you need to to that ground. Yeah. And the other thing that, that has changed is that the concentration of nitrogen in a uh, thousand gallons of slurry or a cube of slurry is now halved. Um, so what you exported last year, you have to export twice the volume uh, this year or counter that is the person taking it in will have to take in twice the volume. So the export and slurry, one is there's an economic cost to yourself and it's just trickier to organize. So uh, I'd see it as being a very limited option. Yeah, okay. So look, that's uh, that's one of the options. So there's a couple of other options that we people are looking at. I suppose the big one that people are talking about maybe, or the two big ones that people probably talk about are the, the reduction in cow numbers and the extra land 
do you want to pick on them uh, or do you want to go down the contract rear and route now and first? I think, we'll, we'll look, we'll, I think we'll, we'll just tip off the, the contract rear and, and then I think the extra land and reduced cow numbers are kind of linked. So we'll, we'll pull through them then if that's okay. Yeah. Very good. So contract rearing, obviously, we, it's been something I'd Michael Burke on uh, back late last in, in the autumn of last year talking about the options that it does. Uh, give to dairy farmers in terms of labor requirements and simplifying the system but now we see it coming into the coming to the fore as a potential nitrate solution option also yeah so look look there's the the, uh, the benefits that were always there for contract earners still there so it reduces labor you know you only have cows in the farm all the things we know there's all the, the, the risks are always there like from biosecurity and actually just sourcing a, a very good rear that's going to do a job they're always there but in that now, you also um, have a benefit, if you like, that you're exporting some of your organic in onto someone else. So that's freeing up, again, your overall allowance for yourself. Um, and I suppose before we get into contract earn, I think the first thing you have to look at is a heifer or you or a, a not one and one to two produces about 81 kilos of organic in. So for every uh, heifer replacement unit you get rid of, you move off farm to a contract rear, you're saving 81 kilos of organic in. That's for the zero to one and the one to two, just to clarify, isn't it? Yeah. So if you're, you're calving down, down, your, down as two year old, that's yeah. true. Yeah. So the first thing I think before you get to the contract turn is actually look at your heifer. So the heifers are non non producing animals on the farm. So if you're carrying huge, a uh, high proportion of heifers, say 30% of heifers, they're eating into your total allowance. Do you require that amount of he- heifers? Do you need them? Or can you carry a more stable number of heifers? That'll free up some organic end first. And I think that's the first place to look at. That's within your own gate, though. It's in your own gate. Yeah. So I think for everyone, Stuart, you look within your own gate before you look outside the gate. Um, so the other thing then to look at then is just be aware of it, I suppose. Um, if you were calving down a two and a half year old, so you are you have not one, one to two, and you're calving down then a two and a half, the organic nitrogen requirement for that heifer replacement unit, because you're carrying for an extra half year, increases to 114 kilos. So again, if you're talking about contract rear rent an extra land and you're calving your heifers a two and a half year old it's sort of a wasted organic end as such because what one it's you're keeping animals longer to do the same thing but also has an impact on profitability as it always did um if there's any heifers being calved a three-year-old the figure will actually increase to 146 kilos of organic in so first uh, make sure you're efficient within your own heifer rearing system they have to be calved a two-year-old um and make sure the, the number of heifers you're carrying is appropriate to the herd that you want to have Within that, um, obviously, if you sort them things out first, and then you look at contract rearing. Uh, contract rearing adds a lot of benefits. Again, like so, you're outsourcing the organic in, as we said. You're outsourcing the labour. Um, you're and you're also um, potentially, if you needed extra slurry capacity on your farm, you're freeing up tank spaces from your own farm because you're utilising the contract rear's tanks for that first year. So in the past, with contract rearing, we normally would have moved the heifers off. And we would have carried more cows. So as the heifers went off, additional cows were put into the system um, to use, utilize the land that the heifers were on. Obviously, within the, the banding and the nitrates, you're not you can't you're not increasing cow numbers. It's about retaining cow numbers um, and freeing up the organic end allowance by moving the heifers off farm. So if we look at that, then and the problem with contract rearing, I suppose, uh, Stuart, is that there's so many contracts out there um that there is no price as such it's very much uh, what the deal you do with the contract rear so you'll hear all you'll hear of all sorts of prices per head and per day and it, they're not they're not comparable some people are paying for the feed some people are not some people are taking them in as calves and bring them on um through the, the the weaning stage other people are bringing them in as weaned animals uh some people are maybe only doing summer grazing so there's a whole lot of different schemes in it but that's up to yourself and your um contract rear sit down and work out the figures i think a dairy farmer needs to look at it too it's not what they can get away with it is what they need to pay the contract rear for the contract rear to do a good job so in reality that the, you're you're using the contract rear's lands so you're you're hiring the use of his time his or her time their land and their facilities so they have to put get an economic return on all them things and the classic statement of uh pay peanuts get monkeys applies 
Yeah, that's probably a better way, quicker way of saying it. Right? <laughs> uh, to, so if we look at then we go down and what we're keeping it simple, I suppose, uh, the cash cost of rearing a heifer based off EPM data from 2022 is about 1,100 euro a heifer. So that's the actual cash cost of rearing a heifer. Um, and if you, as you scroll back down through that, so for, for a dairy farmer to get from not, uh, from a calf to a calf down heifer, it's about 1,100 euro. Um, when you go to the contract rear, you don't save all the costs of the 1100 euro, you save some of the costs. And the reason being, again, depends on the contract, but like in most, far, in most examples, the heifer will land weaned to the contract rear. So the dairy farmer still incurs the costs of rearing the calf. And in most scenarios, the heifer returns to the dairy farmer for the second winter. So the dairy farmer then also has the cost of making silage for the second year. So where the savings are made then is through the first summer, the first winter and the second summer. In most scenarios that the dairy farmer will pay for the AI and the, uh, in the, and the synchronization protocol. So they still incur that cost. And they'll also in some scenarios pay the veterinary charge. So in that, when you're looking back through the costs and depending on the contract rate, but if you're paying over 180 a day, um, and the heifers were off farm for about 520 days, so from over the two years, it roughly cost uh, a thousand euro um, to the contract rear in that scenario. So that's paying over 180 a day for every day that the, the heifers are off farm and an average of 520 days. Okay. Or per 100 cows, it's 22,800. So you'd be paying the contract rear about 22,000 plus or minus haulage, depending where they are. Yeah, that's for your 22% replacement rate for your 100 cow herd. About 20% of the place rich, yeah. Okay. Now, if you look at the savings, then as I said, from the 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 rearing costs, you will say you don't that's what you pay the contract rear, but there'll be some costs you will save on. And the majority of them then we looked at what you will save is you what we have assumed is that there'll be no saving on fixed costs because you, you have to retain the land again because of the nitrates. We're assuming there's no change in labor and whatever else you owe and things of that, and you're still utilizing the same amount of ground, so from spreading fertilizer and things of that, all that cost is still incurred. Where you will make savings is on the variable costs, so the variable costs will be coming from the, the cost of growing the grass and the silage for that, that 520 days, and a little bit on the labor as well. Okay? okay? If we roll that back then, what we are saying is, potentially you will save about 13,000, it's gonna cost you over 20, so there's about that 7,000 of a differential extra cost of uh run uh, to, to cash cost to go to the contract rear over you rearing them yourselves now that might or 70 euro cow if you want to put it that way uh, yeah. of additional charge yeah now that might sound dear to me it's not because for that you're you're renting someone else's use of someone else's farm their labor and their facilities so it's a lot cheaper than any uh potential land lease you could purchase yourself it also has significant impact from a labor point of view on your own farm. And it also de-stresses the, the facilities on your own farm as well, so that maybe you don't have to invest as well. So to me, of all the options out there, contract rearing is nearly one of the better ones. But I do think we have to pay the contract rear, as you have already said about the, the peanuts and things. <laughs> yeah, moving on from that then. So Patrick will say, like, as you said, you're basically saying there that there's 7,000 of a, of a swing in it. And I'd say if you ask any farmer at this stage uh, of the year when they're in their height, in the height of calving and so forth, they would be willing to spend that money on extra labor uh, at this stage of the year, potentially over the February, March, April period in order to try and make things a bit easier for themselves or to make to just get through the work. So it's actually really almost inconsequential in the overall scheme of things. I think, yeah, uh, look, well, we'd have. When you, it's, it's hard to put an economic value on the labor saving as such. Yeah. Uh, let it be no cash equivalence, but gets people out, out of the yard a bit earlier, whatever it is, that's worth something. Um, as I said, if, you, if you're in a deficit of slurry capacity and this saves you putting in slurry storage, there's a saving there. Um, if you are hoping to stock up and carry additional heifers, but now you're limited on your um, allowances for, through the nitrates, Using you actually can use the contract rears allowances as such to allow you to carry up stock if you knew another farm was coming or another piece of land, whatever it is. And then there could be you have you should in theory have more time to focus on the cows that are left. Mm. So in theory, there could be scope to improve cow profitability on the balance of the cows. And if you weigh all that up, it'll be I'd say it'd be thing a lot in difference. 
Okay. So I suppose coming to the two most emotive issues, I suppose, in, that are on people's minds in relation to bending is the potential to have to reduce cow numbers or the, the cost associated with renting extra land. And we've all heard some of the eye-watering figures that have been talked about in terms of the land rental that's been paid at the moment. Like people probably need to sit down and have a, a serious chat with themselves, maybe in some cases, before they actually go and take this land. Is that fair to say? Yeah, look, uh, and I, I, I think there's two things, Stuart. Uh, look, the, the the banding and all that is it, it's in. And it's going to be here forever more. Such um, this is a conversation you can have with yourself every year or your advisor. So, what does some work this year doesn't mean it won't work next year. Um, farms change over time. Profitability changes over time. So, I think this. Uh, I think there's a little bit of a we have to sort all this out this year. You know, maybe the land doesn't come available this year. Maybe it will come next year and you rerun the figures and do it again. Similarly, too, I think there's also a focus. So if for some farms, it'd be a combination of everything. So maybe they have to get some acres of land at a reasonable price. Maybe they're able to get the heifers off for summer grazing and maybe they have to reduce a few cows. So look, it's, 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 that's why there's no answer to any farm. It's a combination of all. But I can see why. The land is the simplest, you know, it's very easy to do the maths on it. You go off and you rent, you pay for X amount of land. It can carry X amount of animals and it's very straightforward. But I think before we go down to, to me asking, I suppose, the, the question I used to, or still hate, I suppose, from a, when a farmer rings you up, how much can I afford to pay for land? Um, or then how much can I afford to buy the land for? There are the two, I suppose. So it's that, that, and that answer comes in how profitable you are already with what you have. So to me, you should never ask how much can I afford to pay for land is how much can I afford to pay to make money? Um, you know, so it's easy to give the money away, but it's, you have to have something back there for yourself. So what we look at first, then when we come into this uh, type of thing, before we get to how many acres should we rent and how many, uh, how much should we pay for the acre is we'll have a look at how we're going on using our profit monitor or your accounts uh, with your advisor, how things are going on your own farm. And what we look at then is say, well, what if we are forced to reduce cows for a year? What, what, what is the impact? So first thing we look at is then we'd say as well, right, we just say we take a 10% reduction, 10 cows across 100. Um, what, will, what will the impact of that on my farm? So the, where we start is with on the variable costs. So if there's 10 cows less on a 100 cow example, you will be down the variable costs of them cows. So obviously they're not there to AI. That you don't have to buy vaccines for them, you don't have to make silage for them. So you're going to save the variable cost of them cows. So that's and that's that's I think straightforward money, enough. Money in the bank as such. Yeah, yeah, but sure, it's a uh, cost money to keep cows. Everyone tells us that. So if you don't have them, then it shouldn't cost as much. It's very yeah. simple. But the other thing we have to look at then in different scenarios is if you have ten cows less on a farm, them cows were eating grass or silage in your system. When they're not there, that grass or silage is now available to the rest of the herd. So if you had 100 cows utilizing 10 ton of grass, you move 10, ton, 10 cows off it, you still have now 90 cows can utilize the full amount of grass. So them cows, there's potential there and a saving for the feed budget on the balance of the herd. So the herd is left behind. So for example, if you found yourself over the last number of years that you're it's, it's, it's struggling just to keep the, the farm fed maybe you have to buy bits of silage every other year or every year the the meal feeding was at 800 900 kilos it's creeped up over time to 1.2 1.3 uh, ton um it could be an indication the farm is probably getting to a point where the you know it's it's growing what it can grow in for wherever you are and the way the environment is going um and maybe you're gone a little bit over the top and as you come off uh the cow numbers then there's potential to put extra grass across the balance of the cows which could have will have a saving on the feed so if you typically on a 10 percent reduction um on a reasonably heavy stock farm you could potentially save about 0.4 of a ton dry matter on the balance of the cows so basically you could reduce your meal feed by half a ton um if because that grass is now available and that means, and obviously there's a, a potential gain then in terms of performance and and that's another, I suppose, indicative sign of maybe if um if you're kind of just pushing the envelope a little bit too hard, if cows aren't performing to the level that you'd like them to perform in terms of both volume and in particular, I suppose, fat and protein percentages, 
it's possibly suggestive that you are just going pushing it a little bit too hard. Yeah, I think what's ha- I don't I don't think anyone planned to be overstocked, Stuart. I yeah, think what's yeah. happened over time is that the, the, there was a planned phase of expansion as such. Um, you got there usually by year three in the business plan. The heifers kept coming. Um, where you plan to be at 100 cows after four or five years, you're at 140 cows. Not and look, there was probably a bit of scope within the land to grow the grass and things. Um, but at a certain point, then the farm could only grow what it could grow. Uh, your feed budget started to creep, and because your cows are stocked at much heavier, you you could see a stagnation on your performance per cow, or even a a, a decrease because the system is creaking a bit. And it would um. So to me, a sign of that you're slightly overstocked was one is that that. Yeah, the cows were milking better than not milking anymore because as we pushed up on cow numbers. Um, number two is if you find yourself exposed to buying, particularly purchase forage, if you find yourself that you never had to buy silage before or in whatever format, that'd be beet or maize or the mix of the odds. Um, and now that you nearly have to buy it every year, that's an indication the farm has got to the point where it's, it's struggling to feed itself. Um, or the, the, the classic one is the, 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 the meal feeding creeps up over time. Um, there are indications that that, that, that that it could be a little bit off balance. And as you unwind that a bit, um, there's potential savings to the balance of the herd. So if we look at it from a variable cost, we're down to variable cost with the cows that are gone. Um, we potential saving to the balance of the herd. So you add them together, and that's the saving on your variable costs, total variable costs. Um, we then look at the fixed costs. Um, and in most scenarios, I think there's no change to fixed costs. And by the nature of fixed costs, that's why they're fi- called fixed costs. Once they're there, they're hard to move. So if we look at the fixed cost structures on farm, we can't drop land because, again, that's going against what we want to do with the whole nitrates. I don't think on a 10% reduction of, of, of cows, there'll be any saving on labour. You could argue small bits around ESB and things like that, but I think we'd be fighting over nothing. So generally speaking, we assume there's no savings across the fixed costs. And all the savings are coming from the variable cost because there's a, a you're destocking a small bit. I suppose just to pick up, I suppose a lot of people are actually after, as you said, nobody's set out their stall to to get themselves overstocked really. But just the national figures in terms of meal fed, notwithstanding the the tricky summers that we've had over the last couple of years, probably since eighteen in particular. But there is a a, a real creep in terms of the quantity of meal being fed. Uh, at farm level and um, it, that's probably an indication that a lot of people could do this exercise and and sh- shed a few cows that in effect I suppose what you didn't mention there either as well as the performance of the 10% that you take out there wouldn't, isn't going to be the even the average of the herd really if you pick out the right cows I think uh, what, we, what we've got is the cost saving so obviously if you're down 10 cows you're down revenue Yeah. Um, and what we look at there is then we say I was right now I, I, I ignore the the sale cost of the 10 cows because that's a one-off event if you know what I mean yeah. so it's not going to be long term on the thing so look in that year that you sell them you may have an extra bit of cash but we don't put into the figures because I think it do a disjustice to the whole thing um so you're yeah you've 10 cows so then you say well right obviously for culling cows you're not going to take the best ones out so the um look just look at milk recordings and things like that like if the herd is doing 500 kilos you're looking at your lower performing cows probably Excluding the, maybe the first and second lactation animals because they're only given a chance to move into it. There could be a 90 kilo, 80, 90 kilo swing um, to the bottom of farming ones. Look, obviously, there, there's ones that are cool themselves, the lame ones and cell count ones. But um, so if you're doing 500 kilos, the bottom 10%, excluding again the younger cows, could be doing, say, 420 kilos. Um, look, if you look at your own milk recording reports, there's plenty of reports there that will identify them cows for you. Um, so then what we look at is, okay, we're down 10 cows by 420 kilos of milk solids. Um, and then you multiply that by the the budgeted milk price that you want to use. Like, and I suppose that that's, we can, that depends on how much, how far you want to go yourself. Um, we normally use about 550 kilo milk solids, somewhere around there, some sort of, we're bringing around a base of 40 something centiliter. Um, and when you do the maths on that, and what you'll find is, it, it, give or take, taking them scenarios, them bottom 10% cows in a slightly overstocked system, you'll save as much as you as you made because you're taking out the worst cows. They're so, no worse off. They're no worse off, yeah, because they're because they're, they're, you're you've potentially gone a little bit too far. Now, if you do the figures um and you're not overstocked, uh, you're not importing a lot of feed, 
um, then the, the only real saving you're going to make is down the variable cost of the, the cows that are gone. And if them cows are better performing cows, yeah, then then, then obviously you're in a different type of scenario. Uh, potentially then you're you're looking at the thing like uh, I'm going to be down in money here and do I, I need to look at all my options, whether I go the contract rearing route or rent additional land or whatever. But I think we have to look within our own farm gate um, to see how are we doing, I suppose, really, before we go mad uh, pay, paying big money for land. And again, if you destock this year, you can restock next year. And if you like, if you take out them, look, people call them marginal cows, you can call it partial budgeting, you can call it what you want. Um, if you do that over one or two years and you improve your situation, that's why I say you rerun the figures, you will be a more profitable farmer. So that maybe over, in, if you revisit the thing in two years' time, um, there's a bit of land coming up, whatever. You're probably in a better position to maybe that you are in a position to take it on at that point. So the, the thing keeps moving like it. This is uh, you'll have plenty of opportunities to fix it. Um, so I think with everything after saying there, I suppose uh, Stuart is look at yourself first before you look over the ditch. Yeah, and I suppose the other thing, Patrick, I suppose is people shouldn't panic either. Like they just need to sit down, steady themselves. Maybe as you said, look at their own situation, see how they're going. Uh, how are they performing relative to co-op averages and so forth and and then we'll say maybe discussion group averages and obviously the herd itself um could they be doing better on what they're doing and if they could how could they go do about doing it the contract rearing is an option obviously as you said the reduction in the cow numbers is probably the last thing that people want to do but in one way it's actually probably the first thing that some people should look at because there are some a share of cows on farms that just really don't need to be there like and they're not offering or contributing anything to the party really uh, and i suppose the, as you said there it's this is a moving feast 2023 mightn't be the year to go renting the land um but 2024 or 2025 might throw up some options that might be a lot better than what you have available to you currently uh so people just need to as i said not to panic um and kind of make a very I suppose cold hard assessment of their own situation and make the, the appropriate decisions that are going to be correct for their farm then in relation to bending yeah um and look if you if you do a profit monitor sit down with whether it be look your accountant or an agri advisor or whatever we have a format there that look in that all the advisors have that, that calculates this thing out relatively fast it's nearly as quick as the way we were after saying it out there. Um, and at least all I can say then is you're if you you're making informed decisions around whether you should rent land or not, you can still decide to go rent it, but you're informed on how it will impact on your cost structure. And if you if at least that the, the exercise in itself is leaving you in a better place, but you understand what's going on in your own farm. And I, and again, I I think Stuart, it could be a bit of everything. Uh, to get you over the line and it could be something different next year um, I know for long term and things like that we want to try to plan it out and all that but there will be options um, you know you might get a contract rear this year but you might get that one next, a good one next year um, so things change over time so and again I think this is nearly you could argue it's potentially part of your annual review or whatever you want to call it your financial review this is the type of thing that you should nearly do sit down and do every year if the, the nitrates or the bandings never was never yeah. mentioned yeah so i'd say it's a it's a very much about the journey as such as what you're kind of saying so go 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 on the journey see see where it takes you and you, it, it'll allow you to decide whether you're to go left or go right really like yeah um and higher stock farms uh, um as i said no different than the contract rear maybe pulling that 10 uh if you find yourself in that thing where you know just the feed costs have crept as we said um you you pull back the few cows you know maybe it's a row of cows less maybe the labor in the yard's a bit happier then they're not under as much pressure maybe the stre- the sheds are not on, on, um under um all the things that the contract rear did w- would also be impacted on this you know you're de-stressing the system so the balance of the herd could actually bounce on more than you think and then get back to and for some people it's just getting back to where they were two or three years ago well, i think we'll leave it at that patrick i think you've given us a very good uh, summation of the options that are there for people and I suppose, as I said already there, the key thing is that people go on this journey first and make the decisions on what direction they have to take with with information and based on good good quality financial in, interrogation of their own situation. So thanks for coming on today, Patrick. No problem at all, sir. Thank you. That's all for this week's episode of the Dairy Edge podcast. And my thanks to Patrick Owing for joining me on this week's show. Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe to the podcast. 
You can also listen on Apple and Google Podcasts as well as Spotify. And for more information, go to the Chagas website at chagas.ie. I'm Stuart Childs and join me next time for your Dairy Edge.